Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Juan Espinosa, Director of Student Success here at the UCLA School of Nursing. Uh, today for our alumni uh, lecture, we have a uh, class of 2015 MECM program, Kelly Castell. Um, he's an enrolled member of the Matthias Colum Cree Nation in Pukatawagan, Manitoba, Canada, in a, in a, like I said, in a 2015 graduate of the UCLA School of Nursing MECM program. He received his Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing Board Certification through the American Nurses Credentialing Center in 2021, and he's a board-certified public health nurse. In 2009, he completed his undergraduate studies with a major in psychology and a minor in education at the University of California, Berkeley. After graduating, he worked for the Native American Health Center in San Francisco, where he was encouraged to pursue a career in nursing. His greatest moment while at UCLA was taking nine nursing students from his master's cohort for a 14-day academic and cultural expedition to one of the most remote First Nation communities Indian reservations in Canada, uh, Pukatawagan, Manitoba. Did I say that right? Very, very close. Good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You'll teach me how to pronounce it correctly. This visit was inspired by his, the First Nations health disparities and crisis cited by the former United Nations Spatial uh, Repertoire on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Dr. James Anaya, during his visit to the community in 2013. While at UCLA, he served three terms as the Powell Donations Coordinator and sat on the Powell Planning Committee for the American Indian Community. His interests and hobbies include traveling around the world to new destinations each year, relaxing in the sun by the pool, and hiking the local hills. Uh, Kelly currently works as an administrative nurse in the Utilization Management Department for the Resnick Neuropsychiatry Hospital at UCLA. In this case management role, Mr. Castle provides medical necessity criteria based on medical records, review and treatment uh, team recommendations to insurance companies for authorization of inpatient and outpatient services. Mr. Castell hopes to continue his work as an advocate to improve the health and well-being of the underserved, including indigenous communities. Kelly is a member of the UCLA, Ameri the UCLA American Indian Alumni Association, Cal Alumni Association, and Sigma Theta Tau Honor Society of Nursing. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Kelly, uh, take it away. Uh, hey, go ahead, everybody. Everybody. My name is Kelly as one just give a nice introduction. I'm a class of 2015 Mackin student and I work as an administrative nurse one for the UCLA Health System at the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital. And um, so I'm going to be giving you a presentation today. Uh, again, this is um, on Indigenous health disparities. Uh, so again, this is just an introduction. This is a really vast topic. It's very interesting to me. I actually learned some new things while putting this presentation together today. So I will guarantee you'll learn something new today from this uh, presentation. Maybe some of the things you've heard before, but um, we'll just jump into it today. All right, so this is just a disclosure. I'm here today voluntarily. I didn't receive any financial gifts or fees for speaking. Coming here as an alumni, um, I mentioned where I work. Uh, so the views of this presentation, they're based on my indigenous perspective and experience, do not represent those of the University of California. And the data information has been compiled from public sources or used with appropriate permission. Uh, some of the objectives today is hopefully you'll be able to define, understand various past, present terms for Indigenous people, understand the history, root causes of health disparities of Indigenous people, define and understand basic principles of social determinants of health, and also be able to discuss the impact of Indian residential schools on Indigenous outcomes, and then just have ideas and a framework for addressing and reducing Indigenous health disparities. And then if I have time, um, provide some ideas for future public health nursing school summer projects. I wasn't sure if this is BSN or Meccan audience, but that's something we did in my program when nice. I was here. Um, so just some basic definitions. What are social determinants of health? So this is a definition from the World Health Organization. They are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. This includes circumstances of birth, upbringing, 
living arrangements, employment, aging, and access to resources and influence. Is there a way can access my notes? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be. To make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, I need to protect it. This thing. Feel like you can share the screen. Put it on the side. I know. So we can do this. That one's being shared. It's good. We're just having a little pause for a technical issue here. Set up before we show you the presentation and the notes. Mm -hmm. This is what you want? There you go. It's fine. Right, cool. presentation is up there. Okay, so I just need to go down to. All right, um, so social determinants of health. Um, so also just wanted to mention, this includes things like uh, access to water, sanitation, environmental protection, education access, access to healthcare, and also shared governance. Uh, these all have to be addressed to reduce disparities and we cannot rely on medical care alone to reduce these disparities. Um, and now how do we go to the next slide? So we'll have to toggle from. Okay, so these are some more definitions uh, from Healthy People 2030. This is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. What is a health disparity? It's a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, or environmental disadvantage. And health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. If you want more details on this, I've provided a link to the website there. And these are goals that are basically to increase health and well-being over the next 10 years, and this is all uh, driven by data. Yeah. How did you do that? Oh, just three fingers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what are social determinants of health equity? We have economic security and equality. This includes things like employment, income, Inequality, poverty, access to food, to education, a uh, person's access to it, the quality of the education, and the outcomes of the education. They're not all uh, the same, depending on, depending on what community you're in. Uh, things like physical environment, well, air, do we have clean air? What kind of technology do you have access to? Housing, is it crowded? Is it poor? Is it available? Uh, things like disasters, roads, do you have road access? Are the roads paved? Are, you, are they only available in the winter? Sanitation, do you have running water? Land ownership, do you have issues with land ownership? A lot of indigenous people have issues with that. And then urban sprawl, cities continue to grow, they continue to sprawl, that causes issues for indigenous people as well. And my note, oh, you got my notes hey, up there. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Bye. The next one? Yeah. Oh, actually, then we missed. I'm trying to see my notes. Oh, yes, this is okay. Yep. Sorry, guys, it's a little bit of a technical thing here. Um, okay, then the last three social determinants of health equity include social community context, things like conflict, war, displacement, gender inequality, mm -hmm. imprisonment, social connectedness, uh, behaviors such as exercise, substance use, nutrition. These can all affect a uh, person's health equity and then healthcare. Do you have access? What is the cost? What is your healthcare system like? Is it effective? Is it efficient? Is it available? Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit here about indigenous histories. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the term of colonialism, uh, but basically colonialism aimed to exploit cultures, resources of colonized regions asserting that the knowledge and lifestyles of the colonized were inferior. A lot of indigenous populations experienced this, such as communities in Australia, Canada, New, 
New Zealand and the United States all have comparable colonial pasts linked to United Kingdom. Uh, indigenous people's current challenges right now include intergenerational trauma, economic hardships, racism, social concerns, and insufficient health care access. Uh, in, in indigenous people in Canada and the United States were both forced to live on lands owned by government. These are called Indian reservations. Here in the United States and Canada, they're called Indian reserves. And these uh, Indian reservations often have no economic opportunity, high unemployment rates, poor housing, lack of sanitation, increased poverty, and social problems. Yeah. Um, and these were really created to manage indigenous people and then take over land that is highly desired. And uh, to this day, we're one of the last legally segregated populations in the world. Uh, so indigenous, where did this term come from? It's from the term Latin indigena, which means native to the country. It refers to the earliest known people of a region or country. These are other terms that were also referred to as First Peoples, First Nations, Native People, Aboriginal, Native American, Inuit, Eskimo, Alaska Native, Indian, American Indian, and Métis. These are all terms that are used mainly in North America. I'm sure if you go outside of North America, there'll be other terms to describe Indigenous people. Um, in the U.S. law, the term Indians refers generally to Indigenous peoples of the North American continent at the time of European colonization. And then finally, uh, Constitution of Canada acknowledges three categories of Indigenous persons, Indians, which we're now called First Nations, Inuit and Métis. So as you can see, just defining Indigenous people alone is a very complex topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to go over some of these uh, definitions. For me personally, I say I'm Native American, people understand immediately. If I give them any of these underterms, they're a little confused. Um, and then uh, also defining of indigenous peoples by governments in many countries, it's complex because it's tied to legal and judiciary or financial obligations. And it's based on historic treaties, land claims and settlements. Uh, so in the United States, we have 574 federally recognized Indian tribes. There are 9.7 million Alaska natives and native Amer American Indians in the United States. Um, the United States Immigration and Nationality Act has a, uh, defines native, native people from Canada as American Indians born in Canada. And they have a qualification. In order to qualify as an American Indian born in Canada, a person must present, possess at least 50% or more blood of the American Indian race. Wow. Uh, this section of the Immigration and Nationality Act is based on the Jay Treaty of 1794 between the United States and Great Britain. Before they put up that border, they said, uh, basically, you have to allow these Native people to continue to allow to come across to work and live and study. So that law is still in effect today, which to me is one of the greatest benefits for us on the Canadian side, is we basically get you know, citizenship in the United States, dual citizenship. Um, so it provides a legal right for American Indians born in Canada, as we're referred to as, uh, to freely cross the border to work, study, live, and retire, and never be denied entry. Uh, interestingly, um, one time I was coming back from Canada and I got, I got pulled aside for secondary screening. And there was a supervisor and he said, oh, he says, what's your background? And I said, I'm Native American. He says, oh. Like one moment, he goes to the back, comes back a few minutes later, and he, he says to me, he says, I am so sorry we pulled you aside for secondary screening. I don't know if you know this, but as a Native American, right, we can never deny you entry to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that was so validating for me. Mm -hmm. You know, like he, he knows this treaty mm -hmm. and he knows his laws. Oftentimes, or depending where you cross the border, a lot of immigration officers, they don't know their own policies or the law. Oh, and wow. I have to educate them. I point out section 2.289.1 of the Immigration Nationality Act. They're really impressed that I know that. Wow, yeah. <laughs> I've schooled them at the San Diego border crossing too, because they, they look at me and they think I'm uh, you know, Latino or something else. And when I say Native American, they kind of question me. But I, I know the, the laws in the background. So it's very wow. interesting. So, the requirements for this is you have to have proof of your ancestry based on familial blood relationships. Um, and then the requirements basically you have to have your long form birth certificate showing the names of your parents, 
official letter from your band or tribe showing that you're a member and a letter of blood quantum that has to come from your tribe showing your parents and grandparents information. Give them a passport photo and also your certificate of Indian status, which is issued by the government of Canada. Um, so I'm going to be focusing more on the indigenous people of Canada because that's where I'm from. And some of the, the, the history is very similar with the United States, uh, but there are some slight differences as well, but very similar histories up until this, this day. Um, so indigenous people of Canada, they maintain a constitutional relationship with the federal government, also known as the crown up there because we still have ties to the UK. Uh, this relationship encompasses our recognize and affirm indigenous and treaty, treaty rights, which is outlined in section 35 of the Constitution Act of Canada as of 1982. Uh, so for Canada, we have a population of 1,127,010 First Nations people. There are 619 federally recognized First Nation bands or tribes. In Canada, we refer to the tribes as bands. Uh, the federal statute in Canada is known as the Indian Act. So this provides all the laws and regulations governing or respecting Indians, as they call us. Under the Indian Act, Indian means a person who pursuant to this act is registered as an Indian or entitled to be registered as an Indian. They also call us treaty Indians because we sign treaties with the government. So treaty mm -hmm. Indians are persons who belong to a First Nation or Indian band that signed a treaty with the Crown or the federal government. Registered or treaty Indians are sometimes also called status Indians. Do you see how many names are thrown at us and how yeah. complex and confusing that is? Yeah. Even just for the names, the names have evolved since I was a kid. I remember being called Indians when we were a kid. And as I got older, it was more politically correct to be called native. And now the more politically correct, actually the, the term that they asked us one year, what do you people want to be called? And they came up with the term First Nations. Went, wow. Okay, cool. That's that's a great name. So that's that's what they refer to us now as uh, First Nations. Uh, so this is just an example of what the card is that we get from the federal government. It was just recently updated in 2019. It shows your registration number, which is uh, shows you what tribe you're from and what number uh, you're in the tribe. My number is like uh, 311. That identifies my tribe, and then it gives an individual number. Uh, for your where you are in the tribe, and then your name, date of birth, expiration. And then recently, 2019, they added a machine readable zone so that you can cross the borders. Mm -hmm. Before, we didn't have that. Um, and so Native people were having trouble crossing the border because uh, citizenship and immigration needed this little thing to scan those machines, uh, you know, when you come through the borders, yeah, yeah. the thing uh -huh. on your passport. So they added that to our status card. So this is uh, just kind of an example of what it looks like. Uh, so more about Indian status in Canada. I'm just talking about these things just to show you how complex it is, even before we get to health disparities, just yeah. identifying as an Indian and to be uh, recognized as an Indian uh, to qualify for some of the benefits and rights. So um, talking about there used to be laws that permitted scalping, forced sterilizations, residential schools, and then finally the Indian Act uh, registration provisions, which were implemented in 1985. Um, these strategies were used to fulfill Indian policy goals that prioritize the elimination of indigenous people rather than their assimilation. So that's how this, this law is set up to uh, basically qualify as Native American. Eventually, the bloodline is going to run out. There's going to be no Native American people. So the government has no more financial obligations to Native people. So. Um, on this chart here, I'm just going to stand up. I know people on Zoom might not be able to see it, but you see at the on this chart here, you have a six one and a six one. Um, so these are uh, these these are categories of the Indian Act that you get registered under. Section six of the Indian Act deals with registration or eligibility to be recognized as an Indian by the government. So if you have two parents that are recognized as six one and six one, your child is going to become six one. Right. If you have a parent that's six one and one that's six two, they'll also become six one. So six one is basically like you're a full fledged one hundred percent Native right. American. Six two, a rough way to look at it, even though Canada does not recognize blood quantum, they recognize these categories. You can look at six two as kind of somebody's being fifty percent. 
Okay, so if we get a 6, 1 and a 6, 2, they're a 6, 1. If you get two 6, 2s, 50 and 50, they make a 6, 1, 100. If you get a 6, 1, bearing a non-Indian, say, you know, somebody from France, their child will be registered as 6, 2, so kind of like half. But if you get a 6, 2 and somebody that's non-status, that's where it'll end. You're not status. Yes. Wow. And so eventually, someday, that's going to happen. Because we're, we're, we're obviously not going to be, you know, yeah, because we're living in a global yeah. society today. So that's the way this was set up as a point to eventually end the government's financial <laughs> fiduciary obligations with Native Americans. And in the United States, similarly, they set up blood quantum. Because eventually, we're not going to be 100%. We're such a global world today. And so that's been how both countries set up their... their um, eligibility for Indian status. So it's a very complex uh, you know, process. Um, and then interestingly, uh, let me see, uh, there's this topic of enfranchisement. So before 1985, a lot of Indians lost their Indian status through enfranchisement. So what that was, there were three ways a person can lose enfranchisement. So this basically led to an individual no longer being classified as an Indian according to federal government laws. There was three ways between 1869 and 1985. An Indian woman who married a non-Indian man would lose her Indian status and she would become enfranchised. And then uh, the, other, the other ways, like uh, number two, between 1876 and 1920s, they lost their Indian status if they earned a degree and pursued a career in medicine and law or if they earned a degree and then they met the criteria to be fit or civilized in Canadian society for enfranchisement, or they became a priest. And then finally, between 1876 and 1985, registered Indians could apply for enfranchisement by demonstrating their suitability and integration into society. And at the time, it was, it was really a really hard, it was a hardship to be classified as an Indian. So people were, were, were trying to, you know, enfranchise. So they become part of Canadian society, get voting rights and become full, full-fledged members. So some people did that. And to this day, the families that did that, they were never able to get it back. But it's being fought in the legal system today because we have a more just society today, but it's taking time to undo a lot of these laws. And my mother was actually one of these women who married a non-Indian man and she lost her Indian status. She's 100% full blood Cree. <laughs> and she lost her status and then gained it back under another law, which we'll talk about. Uh, so primary aim again of Indian pol early Indian policy was to acquire indigenous lands and resources while simultaneously decreasing government's financial responsibilities. Uh, this has been detrimental to indigenous health fostering disparities in social, political, economic realms, which have fueled onset of health inequalities and poor outcomes. Uh, there was a forced assimilation practice implemented in the 18th and 19th century where indigenous children, they were removed forcefully from their homes and sent to residential or boarding schools, which had detrimental results. This included loss of language, culture, family, community, and they also experience abuse, mental illness, and family dysfunction. So these are some facts on Indian residential schools. Uh, the children were forcibly taken from their homes by the federal police, known as the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Over 150,000 children were taken from their homes. 90 to 100% suffered physical, emotional, sexual abuse. There was a 40 to 60% mortality rate in Indian residential schools. So many of those children never came home. They were taken, they never returned home. And just recently in the last two years, they actually found mass graves at those former residential school sites. So that's why, you know, some of the kids that never came, they were buried there. They tried to cover it up. It's really, really sad. Uh, there were over 130 residential schools located across Canada. The last one closed recently is 1996. Wow. Um, and I want us to watch a very short video here that I feel is gives a really nice summary of the Indian residential schools. Can we show yes. um, this? It's a YouTube a video. browser. We're just pausing for a second. I'm going to show you guys a quick five minute video on the in Indian residential schools. I feel like it's a nice. Um, 
summary. The mic picks it up. Between 1857 and 1996, more than 150,000 First Nation Métis Inuit children were sent by the Canadian government to special institutions called Indian Residential Schools. 130 schools were built and operated by the government of Canada. And the country's mainline churches, the Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, and United Churches. Beginning in the mid-1990s, thousands of former students sued the churches that ran residential schools and the federal government that funded them. They sought compensation for the loss of language and culture, as well as the abuse suffered in these schools. This led to larger civil suits that were resolved in 2005 with the negotiation of the largest class action settlement in Canadian history, the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement. Since then, the number of abuse claimants has been nearly double the original estimate. In 1925, the newly formed United Church of Canada assumed responsibility for 12 residential schools in places like Port Alberni, British Columbia, Brandon, Manitoba, and Round Lake, Saskatchewan. The total number of residential schools in Canada peaked at 80 in 1931. By 1945, there were more than 9,000 students in residential schools, about half the Aboriginal student population. In schools close to and on reserves, or those much farther away, the students' time was divided. One part of their day was spent attending classes, the other learning farming and trades. This policy of aggressive assimilation removed many children from their families and communities for 10 months out of the year. Within a few generations, native languages and traditions diminished or were wiped out altogether as students were forced to speak, dress, think, and act like non-Aboriginal Canadians. At residential schools, many students lived in substandard conditions and were punished, sometimes harshly, for violating a rigid code of conduct. Many recall the rough cutting of their braids and dousing for lice, as well as the forced removal of their clothing. In the most extreme cases, they endured sexual abuse, the hands of dormitory supervisors, educators, and administrators. It wasn't until the early 1980s that the extent of physical and sexual abuse became apparent. By the early 1990s, the legacy of residential schools was a well-established fact. In 1998, the United Church formally apologized for its role in the residential school system. At the time, the church was a co-defendant in a landmark court case involving the former Alberni Indian Residential School on Vancouver Island. It had been 30 years since the United Church closed its last residential school, and just two years since the system shut down for good. An estimated 80,000 former students are still living today. Of those, nearly 7% attended United Church-run schools. Many of their children and grandchildren now lag behind in formal education, just as they once did. It's said that a third of all Aboriginals have less of high school education. One result is that the unemployment rate for Aboriginals between 25 and 64 remains almost twice the rate for non-Aboriginals, roughly 13%. On reserves, as much as 25% remain unemployed. But it's the trauma, neglect, and humiliation that survivors experience 
that greatly contributed to many social problems in Aboriginal communities today. Rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, drug abuse, alcoholism, and incarceration are higher among Aboriginals than other parts of the population. And in a tragic twist, those who suffer abuse and dislocation in residential schools are prone to perpetuating family and community dysfunction in the future. All right, so that's a pretty sad and depressing uh, clip to watch, but that is what happened in Canada with uh, Native American children, uh, including my mother. My mother was one of those 80,000 that uh, went to residential schools, and uh, I, went with, I went through the experience with her of the legal process and all of that while I was here at nursing school doing my uh, master's degree. Uh, she didn't want to go through with it, and I understand, but I encouraged her to do it anyway. It was only twenty thousand um, dollars, or that's yearly. Actually, there's one more thing I'll show you since you asked the question. This will be shocking for you. We're gonna watch one more video here. It's only two minutes, but you just ask the question, and this will answer it, and it actually gives more detail. Ralph Goodale arrived in Regina hoping to fix it. Is what? Yeah. Okay, cool. Just uh, expand. We're going to watch one more video. It's just about the legal process and the claims for these uh, Indian residential school cases. Ralph Goodale arrived in Regina hoping to fix a sad chapter in Canada's history and settled thousands of lawsuits against the federal government and four churches. The reality with the courts is that we simply cannot physically litigate all of the claims that we face. Goodale says at the current rate, the 12,000 outstanding cases would take more than 50 years to get through the courts. His plan to set up a so-called alternate dispute resolution system where retired judges would decide cases outside the court. Goodale says this would take seven years and save nearly a billion dollars in legal costs. We now have at least the opportunity for a faster, more cost-effective, and far more humane and safe way to, uh, to, to deal with these issues. It's a very, very strange program. Regina lawyer Tony Merchant represents more than 5,000 victims of residential school abuse. He says Ottawa's new plan would mean less money for claimants. And he says the process would be dehumanizing, especially one aspect, which he calls Ottawa's Air Miles program. It's a point system to determine how much money claimants receive. For example, a victim of fondling or kissing would get 5 to 10 points. If forced to perform oral sex, 26 to 30 points. And a victim of, quote, severe and persistent sexual intercourse would receive 45 to 60 points. The points would be worth between $5,000 and $200,000. The government, when faced with all of these claims, has difficulty accepting that these are 11,000 individuals with 11,000 painful stories to tell. And they want to clump them together. The reaction of the Aboriginal community itself is split. Some groups approve of the initiative. I think it's important to take every step they can to move forward and, and, and to begin to rebuild uh, families and relationships in our communities and with Canadians in general. The Assembly of First Nations says Ottawa's new plan is unconscionable. That's because it doesn't provide compensation for loss of language and culture. The AFN urges plaintiffs to reject the plan. Jeff Leo, CBC News, Regina. So, as you can see, the, the process, the legal process was very uh, 
and it, 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 it did they did stick with the point system okay. uh, so 20,000 was the average if you didn't want to go through because some people was too too traumatic to yeah. visit those yeah. experiences um, so some people you just say yes I was part of the residential school system you get a lump sum twenty thousand dollar payment which is what my mother opted for um, and then they threw in an extra twenty five hundred dollars to go towards the cost of uh, higher education and so they used that to go towards my my, my master's degree wow yeah. uh, so it bring back the PowerPoint I don't know if you know this, um, but were they forced like out of their homes against their will or did the parents have like a say? No, they were forced. It was required oh. by law. My mom told me the story. She said all she remembers. I'm just recalling the story of what my mom told me of her experience. She's no longer with us and I'd like to keep her story alive and to educate people. Um, she told me, she said, all she remembers, it was this, it's a remote fly-in village, no road access. She, she said all she remembers was this plane flew in Police officers came out and the parents just told them all the children run and they ran into the forest. And the ones that could make it, they were grabbed, put on this plane and they were just forcefully taken. And she said when they landed, they arrived, they were stripped naked, they all had their heads shaved and they were taken into those dormitories that you just seen. And you know, they were none of them spoke English. English wasn't our language. And they were punished for speaking their language. They got beaten. And their mouths washed out with soap. A lot of them were abused physically, sexually. It's really, really hard. I know it was so hard for my mother to tell me this story, but it was also good for me to know, like, my, like, wow, that's wild. You know, people think uh, colonization happened hundreds of years ago when Christopher Columbus arrived. Like, no, it's just my mother, my mother's generation. It's not that long ago. Yeah, um, yeah it's pretty, it's, it's just really unconscionable what happened. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Hopefully running out of time here. I'm gonna quickly go through the disparities. So I'm just kind of laying the groundwork here for you to understand the history of indigenous people and maybe give you an idea of where the health disparities come from. That I'm gonna talk about. So these are the health disparities. Um, I didn't go into the details. I'm just going to give you basic, like I said, this is just an introduction. So indigenous health disparities, what are they? We have increased rates of type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and cancers. And a lot of these are all related to lifestyle uh, because of the poverty, their poor diets, lack of exercise, smoking, increased alcohol intake. And if you think about those residential schools, these people often didn't get any counseling or therapy after that. So what do they do? They have no access to address their traumas. They have greater rates of suicide, self-injury, infant deaths, uh, increased incidence of sexual trauma, substance abuse, violence, also all resulting in increased mortality. Uh, they have limited access to poor healthcare systems. Uh, higher child and youth injuries and death, increased exposure to environmental contaminants, a lot of them live on Indian reservations, which are located in very remote communities. The homes are crowded. They have poor living conditions, low levels of educational attainment, low literacy, increased poverty. Um, we have higher, higher incarceration rates, 32% nationwide in Canada. And of those, 50% are female. Of the female population, 50% are Indigenous. The province of Manitoba, which is just above North Dakota, uh, is 74% Indigenous uh, incarcerated. And that in that area of Canada, the central part, tends to have a higher Indigenous concentration. When you go up there, I mean, I see my, my people everywhere, which is kind of nice for going, oh my God, this is so well, maybe people everywhere. But unfortunately, we have very high rates of incarceration there. Uh, life expectancy was shortened by 8.9 years for males and 9.6 years for females. Um, this is a graph on uh, First Nations who are in foster care or in the uh, Child Protective Services. So from the ages of 0 to 14, we have 7.7% uh, of children. That's the population out of the total. And then if you go to the right of the graph, 
53.8% of Indigenous uh, children under the age of 14 are uh, in foster care. And then we have 38% of First Nations children that live in poverty compared to non-First Nations, it's only 7% in Canada. So you can see the disparities there. Um, incarceration rates on the left side of this graph, the first three columns is Indigenous. The blue is the year 2019, 2020, and the orange is 2020. So you can see during COVID, during the pandemic, the incarceration rates went down. Nobody was allowed outside. How can you get in trouble, right? <laughs> Um, and I think they released a lot of uh, a lot of inmates as well during that time. But it's just staggering the difference. This is the incarceration rates um, per one hundred. Yeah. Um, and then on the right side, the last three columns, there are non-indigenous Canadians. You see the difference there. How many are in prison? How many are not? That's the population in Canada. Um, and actually, this graph, for, for some reason, uh, Statistics Canada only give a graph for four provinces, so it's not the whole country, but they, they just give you a kind of an idea. Um, and then these are the suicide rates with Indigenous communities in Canada. These are the, these are, this is just, uh, the blue is uh, Indigenous, and then the orange is non-Indigenous. So it goes from uh, 1 to 14 years of age at the beginning, second column. We have age 15 to 24, where the suicide rate is just off the chart, 78.8 per 100,000, compared to 11.9 for non-Indigenous. And then it goes down a little bit from ages 25 to 34, the third column, but it's still really high off the chart. And then ages 35 to 44, still really high, 60.9. And then it starts to drop as you go up 45 and 45 and older, it starts to kind of level out to uh, non-Indigenous. But this is one of the, the, the big uh, issues within Indigenous communication is uh, in Indigenous disparities is suicide. Uh, so Indigenous suicide within the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit community, as you see, it ex greatly exceeds the non-Indigenous population. From 91 to 2006, the suicide rate was twice that generally of non-Indigenous adults. Uh, so as I discussed, historical intergenerational trauma, which stems from colonization and ongoing marginalization, are believed to contribute to these elevated levels of suicide. Uh, conclusion, this is the chief of my tribe. Uh, her name is uh, Lorna Bigotty. She's also my aunt, my mom's cousin. Shaking the hands of the former chief. They're in our tribal office there. It looks like they're preparing for some ceremony. Uh, so these are the recommendations. Self-determination and rights. Uh, these are Indigenous people who have long had a paternal relationship with the government where they've been taken care of, being told what to do. To address these disparities is give them some rights, give them some self-determination. They were self-determining before, they can do it again. So self-determination impacts and determinants that affect Indigenous communities, including education, housing, healthcare opportunities. Uh, this will provide guarantees for their involvement in po political decision-making, which will give them authority over their lands, territories, economies, education, and healthcare. And then also exercise of self-determination in land claims, economy, and independent governance has been noted, uh, has been more prevalent in First, First Nation communities with higher levels of well-being. So there are some communities that do exercise self-governance and, and they do have uh, higher levels of well-being. And uh, treaty rights through self-determination have been linked to an increased community income and decreased poverty. And then some of the things that Canada has been doing to reduce the disparity along these lines of self-determination and rights. And this is what I learned. I thought this was great. Uh, I actually used to work, my last job in Canada was working for the Department of Indian Affairs. And I worked in their Indian registration unit, which is basically like vital statistics for Native Americans. Uh, so this was interesting to learn the changes that have gone on in the department, which I think are great. Uh, so in 2017, the government of Canada split the department into two departments, Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada and Indigenous Services. This is to increase the pace towards Indigenous self-governments and as a move towards termination of the Indian Act. Like that is, I never imagined that ever even being talked about, but they're, they're working towards that. 
Uh, so Canada is aspiring to transform its paternalistic relationship with the Indigenous people to one of nation to nation. So these conversations will involve issues around treaty rights, land ownerships, urban Indians, people that don't live on the reservations, they're often forgotten, and determining criteria for recognition as an Indian and tribal citizenship. That's huge because for the longest time, the government said who made the uh, determinations, who's Indian and who's not. But it makes sense. Like every other country around the world makes up their own you know, policies for who becomes a citizen in their country. So Native should too. It shouldn't be based on blood quantum, yeah. right? Um, and then finally here, uh, June, most recently, 20, 2019, they uh, introduced the law uh, respecting First Nations, Inuit, Métis, children around youth and families. And this is uh, basically giving control of child protective services back to Indigenous communities rather than the government having these agencies. It's the Indigenous communities that have their own Native child protective services and with a cultural approach, which I think is, is working a lot better than it was before. And then finally, this is my last slide here. So this is a framework that uh, I think countries and governments can use. This is a declaration from the United Nations. It's a declaration on the rights of Indigenous people. This was created in 2007. So it sets out a global fra framework of basic standards to ensure the survival, respect, and welfare indig of Indigenous peoples worldwide. It covers a total of 46 articles that discuss rights of Indigenous peoples that have a lot to do with rights to consultation, lands, resources, culture, health, education, employment, housing, justice, languages, political systems, citizenship, security, self-determination, and the right to be free from discrimination. And this marks a significant advancement just for acknowledging and advoc advocating for and safeguarding the rights and liberties of Indigenous peoples around the world. And interestingly, when this declaration was passed, the four countries that voted against it were the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. The first four that I mentioned in my first slide that were part of this colonial past tied to the UK. However, down the road, they did, uh, they did uh, vote on this uh, approving of it. But initially, they didn't. They probably had a change of language in there um, that met their thing. Um, so that is the end of my slide. I left a few minutes here, and we do have a few minutes. I just wanted to talk about uh, a trip that I took. And I'll take questions if anybody has questions after this. But as while I was here in the Meccan program in 2014, I took a group of Meccans, 10 of us, to my Indian reservation, which is Pukatawag in Manitoba. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, we saw public health nursing and health promotion in an in Indigenous community. Uh, they learned about Indigenous health disparities, suicide, mental health, comparative health analysis, traditional medicines, and public health nursing practice. This was from September 14th to the 27th in 2014. There were 10 of us from the Meccan, student, Meccan program that went. Um, as I mentioned, Pakanawagan Indian Reservation, Manitoba, Canada. Why? This was to examine the delivery of public health nursing on an Indian reservation where nurses are primary care providers. And also to analyze indigenous health delivery systems, raise awareness of health disparities, and also to support youth through health promotion activities. Those were our goals and objectives when we went out there. Um, okay, so that's my, my reservation. It's Indian Reservation number 198. The band number is 311, a tribe number, and that's our our nation's logo, the Bias Kalo Cree Nation. That's a loon. Oh. Uh, so this is where it's located. There we are in Los Angeles, lower left. Pakatawagan is uh, C, and A is where actually I, I grew up. Leaf Rapids, which is where my mom has her, had her home. So very far to get up there. You have to fly to the border and then drive for 12 hours, and they take hop on a train for three hours to get there. There's no road access. Uh, so what did the students learn? They learned uh, public health nursing practice on a remote Indian reservation. We observed coordinated nursing care on the community setting, community setting. We participated in health promotion activities for the school youth. They gained knowledge, experience of Indigenous health disparities, teachings of traditional medicines used by Indigenous communities. We participated in a traditional healing ceremony known as a sweat lodge. Uh, clinical practice guidelines were introduced for nurses in primary care, including adolescents, adults, and pediatrics. 
and then we gain knowledge of traditional food, hunting, fishing, and gathering practices of the Cree Nation. There's still a lot of people living traditionally off the land. We were hunters and gatherers. People still live that way to this day. Um, and I was actually raised that way as well. Uh, so these are just some pictures. Uh, that's their health center there. A lot of the health centers and reservations in Canada are known as nursing stations because that's all there is. There's no doctors there, just nurses. So it's basically you're operating an ER. You don't know what's going to come through the door, but nurses are primary care providers. So imagine you being alone up there and you're responsible for the health of the community. And so you have access to a phone if you need to fly in a, an air ambulance. That's what you call it. That air ambulance comes to that community pretty often. And sadly, it was just there yesterday. I heard. Um, that's our group in the lower left, the 10 students that went. That's the community in the background. It's really beautiful, actually, but it's just it's so remote and isolated. There's no resources there. There's us on the right getting on the train that travels up there three days a week. It's a three-hour train ride. Um, and interestingly, at the end of that train line, there used to be a gold mine which is why they put in the train line. The gold line the gold line is no longer there. So the government stopped operating the train, but the tribe took over because that was the only transportation to get out of the community. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so there's the nursing station in the winter. The only time they have a road to get in and out of the community is in the winter time when the lakes are frozen over. So they build a road on the ice on the frozen lakes. You can see some vehicles driving there. And there is a people getting on the train in the community. There was an evacuation there uh, two years ago. There was a fire, so everybody was scrambling to try and get on the train to get out of the community. Here we are on the left side at the nursing station. That was one of the nurses that worked there. She was so pleasant. I can't imagine the stress she has, but she was just explaining her job to us and what she does. And then the, the director of the health program there standing uh, who helped really coordinate this program. On the right is the school staff, all the teachers, the chief. Uh, they were so happy we came. They gave us a tour of the school, all of them indigenous. And then on the left side here, there's uh, one woman from the community showing us indigenous arts and crafts, traditional beadwork. In the middle, we went on out to a uh, fishing camp where there's commercial fishermen who live off the land. So we got to go camping. We got cook off the, the fire. And then on the right, we had our sweat lodge ceremony. So all of our students, they got dressed in traditional uh, Native American regalia with our elder there on the end. And then we took a trip up the river. It was a 12 hour trip. Uh, there's our group. They were met by my family on the left there, really big family uh, who met us, which was really nice. And then the students participated in a cancer walk that they had in the community. They were introduced to the drums. And at the end there, they were watching the Northern Lights, also known as the Aurora Borealis, which uh, some of them had never seen before. So that was nice, they came out. And then here we are on our way back to LA. Everybody was exhausted. It was a pretty rough trip. It was 12 hour, 12 hour drive back. Um, and so there's all my references if you wanna get more information where I pull this information from. Um, and that's it. So I really enjoyed putting this presentation together. I learned some new things. Here's my contact information. This is a picture of my mother. Oh, she's wearing our UCLA nursing sweatshirt. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that is my presentation. Thank you guys on Zoom. Hopefully you were able to hear me. I know I covered a lot of information. Um, if anybody has any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. This is a really complex topic. I don't have all the answers. I still have questions myself, but I did learn some new stuff putting this presentation together for you guys. So thank you so thank much, you. Kelly. That was a wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions in the room or the Zoom. Yeah, I was just wanting to thank you. It's well put together, your presentation. It explained a lot. That This is very new to me. I am shocked that this is not more talked about even like on the, on like a wider spectrum. This is incredible. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely nice to know that there's a need there and maybe that I can, you know, be there to facilitate some care future so i mean i i would like to visit do you have to be invited into a tribe or um well usually i mean it would take somebody to kind of bring you in there especially where, where we went i mean 
nobody ever knows <laughs> there. No, oh, actually, one year was really interesting. There was a group of Koreans. Okay. They just, I mean, anybody can go on that train, but usually it's only people that live there. But this group of like 10 Koreans, they, they decided, I don't know, they looked it up on the map. They said, we're going to go there. There's no hotels there. There's no, it's, it, there's one store there. There's a nursing station. There's a school. That's it. But this, they got word there's this group of Koreans coming. The community welcomed them. They put them up in their homes. They toured them. It was really it made the news, but it was just so ironic. It's just not a place to go. But you would need to know somebody to go up to one of these communities. But it, I'm sure they would be welcoming because okay. not a lot of people come to these communities. They're often forgotten about. And people think like, oh, we can't go there. you know. And, but the community, when I brought all the students, they were so like, they were so happy, like people wanted to come to our community and they were so welcoming. I was really pleased with how it turned out. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question. How did you make happen that trip with uh, the Mekin students? Well, actually it was summer break and I was just planning to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody asked me, they said, Kelly, what are you doing for summer break? I said, I'm going home. They're like, where's home? And I said, oh, where's that? So I'd show them on, they're like, how do you get there? And so I told them, I said, oh my God, can I go with you? And then word got around. I said, well, okay, sure, you can come home with me. Then the word started getting around, and next thing you know, all these Mekins wanted to come. Oh, wow. So I said, well, let's turn it into a trip. Wow. Mm, definitely. It sounds, I wish someone would take me right now. <laughs> yeah. I want to go to one locally, not too far, though. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of tribes okay. in California. Yeah. I'm sure they would be receptive. I'm sure they have a lot of visitors. And I came later. I apologize. No and Liz, what are you doing now? And, you know, now that you've finished the program and you're working in the community, what would you say uh, is the biggest need that you see? And how can... Um, students be exposed to those communities where they're needed the most? It's a really good question. Uh, so right now, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm administrative nurse one. I work uh, for the UCLA Health System at the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital. So as you can see, I went into mental health mainly because of where I came from. There's a lot of need. Uh, there's clearly a lot of need here in Los Angeles. As you can see, we just go for a walk out on the street. We need mental health. And I don't know if a lot of you know, but we're actually opening a brand new hospital in the middle of Los Angeles. Uh, uh, it's on like, yes, Olympic and Fairfax. Uh, we're going to be one of the most uh, state-of-the-art psychiatric hospitals in the country. It's going to be 125 beds. And we're going to have like 25 observational beds. We're moving out of uh, Ronald Reagan here because we're expanding, uh, which is great. So we're expanding our mental health services here in LA. Um, but for students to get exposure, um, that's a good, that's a really good question. I might have to get back to you on that. But and just that exposure, just I think when sometimes when you see such uh, disparity, right? How how could we be better at understanding different communities. Because I think we're so used to going to UCLA Ronald Reagan for care, right? And being exposed just to the nicer parts of town. When we go out, when our students go out and become nurses, right? How do you, how do, how, I don't know how I, I could say this, maybe understand the need that's out there, that there's so many more other opportunities where they're needed as well. Well, I think for me personally, when I was in the program, the public health nursing program gave me a really good exposure of the different areas of nursing we could go into. I mean, for me, the most memorable thing for me was when we went downtown to the county jail and we went into the Twin Towers and when you go in there, even the officers, they can't bring their guns, they can't bring their weapons. We saw that, we're like, it's the same. <laughs> but we went in there and it was so eye opening. I would never be, I would never have seen that before in my life, but it was very eye opening. So there is value in being exposed to that. Um, so I think that's one way through your public health nursing course. Uh, I feel like the public health nursing instructors would probably have some ideas. Um, and I know, um, at least before, they used to organize a trip that goes to Cuba. I don't know if they still do that for the public health nursing. Uh, but that's kind of why I showed that um, 
my trip at the end to give, you know, nursing students or faculty ideas for, you know, maybe coordinating future summer trips or doing projects with students and making it happen. Uh, but public health nursing, I mean, we got tour of the water treatment plant here in LA. Uh, we went down to Skid Row. We visited some of the communities in there. We did a part that was eye opening to yeah. me too. Like, wow. Yeah, I think you guys are doing a good job. I think, uh, so I'm in the uh, UCLA Health Collaborative for the Homelessness. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been, we go around communities and, you know, we help homeless and it's definitely, there's a lot going on out there. So I think that is helpful. I never knew that there was such need, right? Mm -hmm. So a difference between, uh, but maybe like, I don't know if this is possible, but like a clinical site at one of these, I don't know, if that's a thing, I don't even know <laughs> anything close enough that students would be open to travel to. I mean, that would take some coordinating. Like even for this to happen, I had to get approval from the Canadian federal government because they oh. have jurisdiction over these nursing stations in oh. the Canada and the employer for those nurses is the government of Canada. So I had to like go pretty high level, but luckily I knew some people I used to work at the government and I knew some people in the community. So we were able to clear those hurdles. Uh, so it does take some legwork to make that happen. Um, like I could see, you know, because there's so many uh, tribes around Los Angeles, I mean, you could probably reach out to one of the tribes and uh, work with the, um, it's the Indian Health Service that manages the care uh, for those tribes. And uh, maybe you could coordinate, even if it's just a day or two, um, but it also puts kind of some the workload on the, the staff that are there as well. So it's, it's, it's a lot for them. Even, you know, when nursing students come to the hospital yeah. during the preceptorship, and it's, it's more work. So you'd have to, you know, find the right person to make it work and you got to give them some buy-in and stuff. Exactly. Um, but that's, that is possible. I mean, I think that'd be a great idea if you could coordinate with one of the tribal communities around the area. Even one of the urban ones would probably be more open to it, like uh, San Manuel. Mm -hmm. If you see their name anywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere in a big casino, they would probably be open to that. Okay. Um, I mean, they're more... Um, they're, they, you know, they're called like urban Indians, so they have access to more resources, and they they also probably the ones that people are more familiar with. When people yeah. say, "Oh, all Native people have casinos," and they happen to be one of the people that have one of the tribes that have casinos, so they're probably a little more well off. They have more resources. Their reservations are probably going to be the nicest you'll ever see on the continent. Um, but to get to ones that are maybe more out there, like by like Fresno in that area, oh yeah, like maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tule River, I know, is one of the tribes out there. I'll coordinate with them. That would be, I think that that would be a fantastic idea if you guys could get that going. Take like a weekend trip out there or something and just spend the day in the community, what nursing practice is like out there. Uh, because there is a need for nursing in those areas. And they have programs actually. When you finish nursing school, loan forgiveness, if you go work out there, they'll forgive your loans. Yeah. Um, huge need in those areas by the Indian Health Service. Yeah, maybe reach out to Indian Health Service. They might Nothing they might actually throw in some money to because it'll also foster recruitment for them, which is what they need. And then they they'll have you know extra people there helping out. Yeah, right? and they, like they, they would bodies. be that they would be able to clear all the red tape and hurdles and what you need, you know, HIPAA and all of that kind of stuff. That's the main thing when you go into communities privacy, uh, protecting yeah. your community, and not being invasive, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, I have a class right now, so but uh, uh, yes, uh, I have your email. I want to thank Kelly once again, uh, for spending uh, the last hour with us here. Uh, we're very happy to have him. Uh, and thank you for those of you who joined us via Zoom and here in the room. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.